Muito obrigado, Manuel. É uma honra estar aqui a TEDx ao Porto. Agora vou a continuar em inglês. <laughs> so it's an honor to be here and to share my story with you, my story about a journey, an incredible journey through Africa. But as much as this is an opportunity for me to share you that experience, it's a story about Africa, it's a story about renewable energy, it's a story about adventure, it's a story about hope. But I would say it's also a story about personal change, about finding what you love to do, about finding that spark which lives inside all of us and making it burn. Just hope this works. Okay, here you are. Um, the way I'd like to approach it is by painting two scenes of my life which are only one year apart. But for me, they were a world of difference. And I'd like to take you along that journey by painting the first scene. I was a young engineer. Sorry. Okay, there we go again. Um, so I was a young engineer. I joined Shell after graduation. I wanted an international career. And immediately one year after that, I moved to the Middle East to a tiny country called Qatar. It's one of the wealthiest nations in the world because they have an incredible gas reserve between Iran and Qatar. And I was there to extract more gas, to build a factory, but the longer I was there, the more I didn't feel good about what I was doing. There was something not right. I was far away from family and friends. I had a broken relationship. And I wasn't really sure where I was going. I was working for an industry that at best provides energy to the world and at worst is the cause of wars, pollution and climate change and it didn't sit well with me. Now let's move one year forward, only one year forward. One year later, I had cycled almost half the length of Africa. I'd started in Cape Town and ended in Nairobi. I'd cycled 7,000 kilometers and I'd passed through nine different countries. I'd started in South Africa, went through Namibia, Botswana, Zambia, Malawi, Tanzania, Rwanda, Uganda, and ended in Kenya. I had raised almost 120,000 euros for a charity called Solar Aid. They provide energy and electricity through solar panels to rural areas in Africa for the millions of Africans that don't have access to energy. And with those 120,000 euros, I could power more than 40 schools. But what was personally important for me was that I'd made a change in my life. I'd been able to fulfill a dream. And now you may wonder, how do you go from this almost depressing situation in Qatar to, for me, a very important moment in my life where I'd moved in a direction where I wanted to go? And the way I'd like to do that is to take you through my little book of dreams. And the first thing that I'd like to, and the, and the way I've, I've sort of structured it, is in five different steps. The first part is awareness, and the second part is execution. And when I look back, when I look at my own situation, I had to learn to dream again. I think when we grow older, we maybe grow more cynical about life. We don't quite know where we're going. All those childhood dreams that we had, they may have disappeared. And the same had happened in my case. I'd grown up in a family where public service was of paramount importance. My father worked for the UN for 30 years. His, 
mission in life was to alleviate poverty and hunger. He was a role model for me, and I wanted to make a difference. But I remember waking up one day in Qatar at the age of 30 and thinking to myself, what have I done? I've done absolutely nothing. In fact, I was working for an industry which I felt I was rather doing good, I was doing bad. And so I started searching for purpose. How could I make a difference? What could I to do to make a difference? But I realized that I was fascinated by energy because energy forms the building blocks of our society. The growth, the prosperity that we have here in the Western world is all thanks to energy. And I started reading and I read this book by Thomas Friedman called Hot, Flat and Crowded. And in this book he describes a term which he calls energy poverty. And to understand energy poverty, I'd like to show you this picture. Has anybody seen this before? Please raise your hand if you have. Well, it's almost all of you. <laughs> okay, that's great. Um, what, what is the thing, when you see this, what, what comes to your mind? Is there anybody that wants to make a suggestion? Somebody said Africa. Sorry? Exactly. And what about Europe? Full of lights, obviously. And the contrast is huge. And what I discovered is that more than one in four people on this planet do not have access to electricity. And in Africa, it's even worse. Almost one in two. More than 600 million Africans in Sub-Saharan Africa do not have access to electricity. And I thought, what if we could provide these people with renewable energy? Could we harness the power of the sun, the wind, the hydro? Africa is abundant with all these renewable energy sources. And there a thought was born. At the same time, I'm in love with sports. I'm in love with the outdoors. I love nature. I'd climbed Mount Kilimanjaro in 2009. And I started thinking, I had this crazy idea. I want to do something. I want to make a difference. I love the outdoors. I want to help these people gain access to electricity. What if I start raising awareness for this cause? What if I go to Africa and cycle? Could I help these people? Surely if I cycled through Africa, somebody would notice. And maybe if I did that, I could hopefully provide this, these millions of Africans, and not that I could do it, but maybe I could add just a little bit from my own, contribute a little bit myself. Maybe with that electricity, I could improve their education. And maybe with this education, I could improve their economic productivity and go on a spiral on the way up. And right there, a dream was born. However, once you have dreams, you run into the next step, which is fears. And I had two major fears. And by the way, I'm just showing you some pictures of my adventures through Africa, but at this point, I'm not in Africa yet. I had two major fears. What I feared was change, and what I feared was thinking big. I feared change because I thought if I was going to change my situation, I could fail, and if I failed, I would look bad. And so for me, looking bad at that point in time simply wasn't an option for me. But becoming aware of those fears greatly helped me overcome them. The other point I wanted to make was the, f the point about fear, about fear of thinking big. Life is not a linear process. We often think that in order to get to the top of the ladder, we need to go on every step of the ladder to get there. But I realize that's not true. Sometimes we can jump a few steps of the ladder. I had never cycled more than 100 kilometers in my life. And I was there thinking to myself, well, maybe I can cycle 7,000. Now, I'm not suggesting that after this talk, you sign up for an Everest expedition tomorrow, because you know, even if you don't make it to the top, I'm sure your wife or your husband will kill you for even thinking about it. But maybe you can consider something big like that. Becoming aware of your fears is greatly liberating because, helping, because it helps you face them and helps you overcome them. But then comes again the next step, which is about time. The time is never right. There's a famous American motivator called Napoleon Hill who said, don't wait. The time is never just right. And once you realize this, this is incredibly liberating because I had so many excuses in my life why I should not go on this trip. I had a career with a big oil and gas company, and even though I 
wasn't that happy about it. I thought, I can't quit now. I can't quit my career. I was on a big project and my boss didn't want me to leave. But when I realized the time was never right, I thought, well, if the time is never right, then I might as well go. And so I started taking steps to actually go. And so what I did was I applied to an MBA. I got accepted and that gave me half a year window to take this journey. And once I was accepted, I went to my boss and I said to him, boss, I am going to cycle from Cape Town to Nairobi and I'm going to raise awareness for renewable energy. And he looked at me and he said, Rick, you have gone crazy. But I said, no, this is what I want to do. And I was fortunate because he had a South African wife and he said, Rick, go and do it if that's what you want to do. And the very next day, I did another liberating thing, which is I bought a one-way ticket from Amsterdam to Cape Town. And I knew at that point, there was no way back for me. I put pressure on myself. It was the 23rd of August, I had to leave. And that takes me to the next step, which is about execution. Once you've decided to go and do something, stop planning and do it. I had exactly three weeks to go and execute this trip. In these three weeks, I worked like crazy. I moved back from Qatar to the Netherlands. My passport had expired. My debit card was gone. I had no sponsors. I had no media. I had no website. In fact, I didn't even have a bicycle. In three weeks, I ran around the Netherlands like mad. I called every single person. I worked 18 hours a day. But the beautiful thing is that once you really want something, when that fire is burning inside of you, there is nothing that will stop you. And so on the 23rd of August, even though I was nearly burnt out, I was standing at the airport with my family. My mother was crying because she thought she would never see me back. I tried not to cry, but I was quite insecure about the whole adventure. But I sat on a plane to Cape Town. And that takes me to the last part of my little book of dreams, which is if you're going to dream, then dream big. You can dream small, but in my case, I wanted to dream big. I thought if I'm going to do this, then let's do it big. There's a lovely little book by Paulo Coelho, which I'm sure you've all read. It's called The Alchemist. And in his book, he writes, if you really want something, if you really believe in something, then the universe will conspire to make it happen. And these words stuck in my mind. And it's incredible what, what you can do once, what, 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 what you can get yourself to do once you believe in these things. I had set myself the goal to raise 50,000 euros, and I had no idea how I was going to do it. When I arrived in Cape Town, I had 100 euros, sponsored by my parents because they were probably worried that if I had arrived in Nairobi, I would have nothing. So I had 100 euros, and then how do you go from 100 euros up to 50. And the beautiful thing is, you become very creative. I was cycling on endless roads through Africa. Here you see a picture of Namibia. Right there in the horizon is the end of the road, but it doesn't end there. It just continues and continues and continues. And imagine doing that for 10 hours a day, 100 kilometers. And in that time, you have plenty of time to think. And I thought to myself, well, what if I start fundraising by organizing cycling events in Africa? And a cycling event really is not that easy, to, not that hard to organize because all you need is cyclists, you need media, and you need a sponsor. Three things, but I had none of them. So I was on my bicycle with my mobile phone. I was calling all the companies in, in Europe, or sorry, in Africa that I could think of, the breweries. I was calling the telecom companies and anything else that came to my mind. And in the beginning, they would all say, well, you know, uh, no. They would all say no. But I became more and more convincing. And after a while, I started bluffing. I said, hey, I have cyclists. I have media. There's going to be a big event in Lusaka on the 19th of October. Are you joining? And inevitably, after a while, some companies would say yes. And once I had my first corporate sponsor, I would go looking for cyclists. And I would tell them, hey, I have a big corporate sponsor. Do you want to join this big cycling event for renewable energy? And then they would say yes. And I would have 40 cyclists. And once I had my sponsors and once I had my cyclists, I would go to the media and I would say, hey, there's this massive cycling event happening in Lusaka. Do you want to join? And of course, they would say yes, because even if they didn't believe in my cause, they saw this crazy Dutch white cyclist. They thought it would be a nice article in the newspaper and, you know, we'll be there. And so what happens when you have all those three? Then you start organizing cycling events. On the 19th of October, I had my first cycling event in Lusaka. 
And here we are with our sponsor and all these amazing cyclists from, from Zambia that were with me and later the media as well. And here I collected my first 3,000 euros. My 3,000 euros which was on the way to the target that I set myself. And all these beautiful women, men, children, old, young, they were all with me. We were all cycling for the same cause. And this was such a successful formula that we continued doing this on and on and on. And we did it as well here in, in Rwanda, which Peter described earlier, which is, I think, just like he said, a beautiful country. And by the time I reached Nairobi, I'd raised 120,000 euros, much more than I could have ever, ever imagined. So learn to dream again. Face your fears. Realize that the time is never right. And once you are aware, stop planning, just do it. And reach for the stars. So what's next for Africa? What's next for me? I did my MBA. I started working for a renewable energy startup in the Netherlands where I'm very happy and I'm gaining the skills so that one day I can go back to Africa and do what I started doing. What is my hope for Africa? My hope for Africa is that one day they will make a development leap. Just like they went from absolutely nothing, they skipped the fixed line and they went straight to mobile phones. I hope the same will happen with energy. My hope is that they will skip power stations, that they will skip electricity networks, and that they will build only small micro solar, micro wind, and make it local and bring it to the people. But most of all, I hope that this journey through Africa will inspire every one of you to go out and find that spark which will light your fire. I hope that the speakers that you heard today, that they will inspire you. I left some little cards with you and I hope you will take them hope. And I hope that it will serve as a reminder for you that you can all do great things, that there's an incredible power inside of us. So with that, I'd like to close and thank you very much for, for your patience and your attention.